And good evening, everyone. I'm Paul Legron. Thank you so much for joining us here on our special event, our live town hall coverage. And tonight we're talking with St. Petersburg Mayor Rick Kreisman as he joins us right now. And uh, if you are watching us uh, on our Facebook page on ABC Action News, be sure to tell all your friends about it. Uh, we want to make sure that we get as many of your questions answered, and this is an opportunity to do it. Mayor, thank you so much for joining us here tonight. Really appreciate it. No, I appreciate the opportunity to be on tonight with you guys. We got a lot to get to. Of course, major breaking news happening just moments ago. Governor Ron DeSantis announcing phase one of reopening the state of Florida, which will start Monday, May 4th. I want to run through some of this. Here's a look at what phase one will look like when this gets underway. Schools will continue to conduct distance learning. Uh, we know that visits to senior living facilities will still be prohibited. Uh, elective surgeries can resume. We also know that restaurants may offer outdoor seating and indoor seating, but the rules go, according to the governor, only at 25% capacity. Other uh, headline here, retail can operate at 25% capacity. Now, there's no change for bars, gyms, or personal services like hairdressers or hair salons. Now, this goes for all counties in Florida except Miami-Dade, Broward, and Palm Beach counties because Southwest or South Florida has been hit so hard by COVID-19. But the bottom line on all of this uh, is that the counties and cities can act on their own, so local local leaders can make their own call. So that brings me to my first question for you, Mayor Kreisman. Will you go along with what the governor is doing, or will you hold off on this? Well, I think what, what the governor's order uh, or whatever, at least what he's talked about, uh, means for all of us is that uh, we're, we're, we're in for continued bad hair days. But in, in all seriousness, um, I, I really need to see and read through his order um, to get a, a clear understanding of, of what he's put in place, what restrictions, if any, there are uh, on us as a city and on, a, on our county here in Pinellas. Um, you know, our experience uh, during this whole pandemic with the orders that have come down uh, from the governor has been, we really need to see what it says versus uh, what has been said uh, on camera because sometimes they don't necessarily match up as clearly. And uh, until we see it, then we'll be in a better position to really kind of judge, all right, uh, what can we do? Do we, you know, what parts of it do we agree with that we're, we're fine? Is there anything um, that we feel that we need to, uh, to go further on potentially? Uh, so at this point, it's you know, I'm, I'm not prepared to say, yeah, I, I agree with everything he said because I haven't read it and uh, I just, I need to do that first. All right. So you're holding off on saying a guarantee that you're going to reopen uh, the city of St. Petersburg. That's where we are right now. Well, it's, it's, I need to see what his order says uh, and be very clear on, on what it says. Uh, I know, you know, what he said in the press conference, but again, you know, we've, we've seen orders in the past that, um, that, that have differed a little bit from what was said publicly. We've seen it where even the frequently asked questions that the governor's office put out seem to contradict what was in the order. So, you know, we want to just be very clear uh, on what the order requires us to do and not do what latitude we have and we don't have. And, and also uh, speak with the county. Um, so, because I do think it's really important that the city of St. Petersburg and Pinellas County are aligned as much as possible. Um, I think it works better. I've, I've said that before. I think if we can, uh, we can act collectively. Um, that that it uh, the 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 end game is better. The end result's better. Certainly eliminates some of the confusion and making sure that everyone's on the same page. When do Absolutely. you think we come to a decision? Do you think that would be over the next 24 to 48 hours? You know. So uh, what I have been doing since Monday, when I met with my advisory group uh, for the first time is uh, following up with them uh, and getting um, their input, their opinions, their recommendations. Um, tomorrow, City Council will uh, hold a Committee of the Whole. Uh, it'll be their opportunity to also share with me uh, their thoughts, their opinions, their recommendations. Uh, throughout this week, um, I'll continue to speak with uh, individually with members of the advisory group um, and even uh, members of the public outside that. I've, I've talked to a number of restaurateurs for example, um, who were not a member of the advisory group that I've reached out to. Uh, and interestingly, some of them expressed and, and wondered what, you know, it, it, what the governor would do, whether he would uh, put a restriction in place on how they could operate. Would it be 50%? Would it be 25%? They expressed some concerns. 
about uh, the ability to, to even open their doors if it was 25%, whether it made financial sense. So these are all things that we want to look at, uh, along with obviously hearing from all of our, our healthcare experts, because uh, that data is really what needs to drive uh, how we move forward. All right, we got a lot of questions coming in. If you're just joining us, we are talking live here to St. Petersburg Mayor Rick Kreisman tonight on our special town hall event. I want to get to as many of your questions as possible. So as we filter through some of these, I want to ask some of these that were emailed to me. Uh, this one, Mayor, comes from Ryan Robertson from St. Petersburg. He says, I'm a hairstylist. I just don't see how it's possible to truly follow the guidelines and work. Uh, we have yet to receive uh, financial help, except our stimulus check. But if the state opens back up, uh, it is almost forcing people like myself to have to go back to work. Uh, he ends it by saying, uh, how is it that the USA has the highest by far cases and we're actually thinking it's safe to start opening things back up? Yeah. And, and certainly I understand the concern that uh, he's expressing. I mean, one of the things that we talked about on Monday with, with the advisory group was was looking at what the indicators are that we thought were important to see. Uh, and I, I kind of put it out there because I wanted to uh, give us some food for thought and then hear back from our, my healthcare uh, experts to see if, if, if I was going in the right direction, whether I needed to be looking at something differently. Um, so for example, we, we, we wanted to see as an indicator um, uh, a consistent number of days. We want to see some consistency in uh, the percentage of positive tests. Um, where, where we really want to see it is, is where, where are we on that? Are they staying average? Are they, are they starting to go down? Uh, we don't want to see a number of days where those averages go up because that means that something's going on out in the community, uh, that we've got some spread happening if we're getting more positive tests. So the, the percentage of positive tests is an indicator. I think that's really important. We needed to know where our hospital stood. Did they have sufficient beds and ICU available? Um, especially with, you know, the governor talked about this today, opening up elective surgeries. Uh, when you do that, that means there are going to be more people utilizing those same beds. And with that happening, are we able to turn on a dime uh, and still make sure that if we get a we've got um, the beds that we have that are needed in order for us to, to protect our community. We wanted to look at testing. What's our capacity as far as testing goes? Can we test everyone? Who presents with symptoms and can we get those results back within a reasonable time not seven days to 14 days but 24 to 48 hours and then lastly contact tracing so if somebody does test positive can we trace who they've had contact with and make sure that we isolate those folks so we don't get that community spread and that surge in our hospitals that we don't want to have happen so i think those are important indicators um yeah so far from what i've heard from the medical community that i've had contact with they agree those are important indicators that we ought to be looking at uh, and that ought to help us decide when's the right time for us to to talk about restarting uh, this is live Q&A with Mayor Rick Kreisman from St. Petersburg. I'm noticing a lot of comments here tonight. I just want to invite everyone to uh, drop in your questions live here. Uh, we're seeing a lot of comments, and I want to pick out a question here from Annette Santarello, who asked, what does all of this have to do with evictions? Uh, Mayor, she asked, has that moratorium been extended? Yeah, that's a good question, and that's that's one of those questions that I'm, I'm really hoping uh, that the governor is going to address in his uh, order. Uh, because the order that he had in place that that put a stay or suspended evictions, uh, at least residentially, uh, I think expires on Thursday, tomorrow. Uh, so I really am hoping that this new order will address that. I, I, quite frankly, I was hoping when he entered the order, and we had been encouraging him to do it for, for a couple weeks, uh, we were hoping it wouldn't just be limited to residential. We were hoping it would also include commercial, uh, because we know a lot of businesses are struggling mightily and uh, you know being able to make that rent payment and not having to worry about being evicted is is a serious concern so uh, we're waiting to see what that order says because I, unfortunately I can't enter an order uh, that would control that issue it, it has to come down from the governor and that really is you just hit the heart of the conflict here when you're weighing public safety against the fact that people's livelihoods 
uh, are in danger, and that has real consequences too. Uh, small business owners who are struggling to get relief, uh, employers uh, and employees uh, who are right now trying to figure out where their next paycheck is going to come from. Uh, the amount of stress that those folks are facing uh, in the middle of a pandemic, uh, there's a lot of moving parts to this whole thing, and it, it, the fault lines don't always cut cleanly for everyone on this. Just to offer up another perspective, uh, Rowan Tucker is asking us, uh, what is more dangerous, the pandemic or the collapse of living standards? People will start getting evicted, cars repossessed, et cetera. Then there will be problems we can't address. Uh, and this goes back to you and I were discussing earlier before we started. I don't envy decision makers right now, uh, Mayor, who have to sort of conduct this all in the in real time uh, when you don't know how this is going to play out yet. So how do you reconcile those two realities of, of people's livelihoods being at stake and the consequences that come with that and the intersection of public safety? Yeah, you know, one of the comments I made on Monday um, is that on the day that I was going to what you were saying about decision makers, the day I was sworn in, they didn't hand me my pandemic playbook. Um, and so, yeah, we are, we are having to weigh some very difficult decisions as we go. And here in St. Pete, you know, one of the things that we've tried to do is uh, obviously, you know, we, we take public safety and the health of our community very seriously, but we also know uh, that the decisions we make impact people economically. And so we started that Fighting Chance Fund uh, and we did that, uh, you know, 20 days ago, we, we rolled that, that program out to try and help some of our small businesses that we knew uh, were being financially negatively impacted uh, by this pandemic and by having to close their businesses down or limit the, the kind and the way they were doing business uh, to, the, to the degree that our resources allowed us to do. Uh, and yeah, it's a tough decision. You know, one of, some of the statistics that we've seen recently, um, what they've said to us is, and this is, this is horrible what people are experiencing, um, but the, the, the numbers of what would happen if we open too quickly and then have to shut down again, the impact on our economy is, uh, according to some of the experts, is, is far worse uh, and would have far longer ranging impacts than if we go a little bit slower, move slower and cautiously uh, and, and try and use the best data we have available to open slowly in phases as opposed to just throwing the doors open and hoping that we don't have that surge. And so that's really the philosophy that we're trying to implement. Um, if I could go back for a second, you mentioned that the previous questioner, I think was the, had the hair salon. Uh, if, if your salon, if your station is here in St. Petersburg uh, and you are a registered business in St. Petersburg, um, tomorrow we are opening up phase two of our um, fighting chance fund. Uh, I want to encourage you to apply for funding from the city uh, because you will now be eligible for funding from the city. Phase two is expanding the eligibility uh, from where we were in phase one. And so if, if you are uh, in the uh, restaurant, if you're a bar, if you're a retail, if you're uh, personal services, uh, go to the city's website, stpete.org backslash fighting chance fund uh, and take a look at what the criteria are. We have $5,000 uh, that we that we want to get into your hands uh, to help you uh, survive this. And if you're an individual who's lost your job or, or your your wages have been impacted dramatically, we've got $500 that we want to help uh, get into your pocket. And the county is getting to roll out, is going to be rolling out their program this week with, with dollars to help also. All right, let's get to some more questions here. Uh, Marcel is asking us, when can we expect decisions to be announced about St. Pete and Pinellas County? I know you covered that a little bit, but just for the sake of answering his particular question, sure. that's a work in progress as we speak. It is, and, and uh, I, you know, the county administrator and I um, uh, talk <laughs> frequently, uh, and uh, we will be talking again. Both of us were waiting uh, to some degree. We're, we're going about our job of trying to figure out for our communities, him for Pinellas County and the 24 municipalities within the county, and of course myself for the city of St. Petersburg, what do we think makes sense as to the when? When is the appropriate time to restart and the how? Uh, what does that restart look like? How do we restart? Uh, and then we were, gonna, we were gonna communicate with each other and try and make sure we're as aligned as possible with what that looks like so that uh, people have consistency throughout the county and, and what a restart looks like. 
I want to get to Michael's question in a bit, but I do want to ask because we kind of skipped over Jessica's question here. Uh, what about dental offices? Are they cleared to open for elective procedures? Yeah, yeah it, 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 uh, and I'm not sure how the governor's order is going to define elective procedures, whether dental offices are included or not. Um, you know, that that's one of those things that I think is going to be interesting to, to, to see in his order, because I think there was there was a lot of confusion to some degree in, in the orders that have been uh, previously out there. I know at times the county and, and us as a city, we both have kind of struggled uh, to make sure that we were real clear on what the governor was was saying we could or we couldn't do and what our business community could and couldn't do. So uh, hopefully there'll be some clarity between the order and any frequently asked questions that has his office puts out. All right, Jessica Duran, thank you for that question. Let's move next to Michael Kushner uh, asking us how we prepare for a second wave in the fall or even next year so that we don't have to quarantine. And uh, really that is that is the $64 billion question, isn't it? I mean, because we know yeah. there will be a second wave. We don't know the severity of it, but we know that if we don't get this right the first time that uh, we yeah. could be paying the price in six months. Yeah, absolutely. And Michael, that's a great question. And, you know, the one thing that I think people have focused in on when we've talked about the importance of, of uh, staying at home or social distancing is, and, and, and even flattening the curve, we've heard a lot about, we want to make sure uh, that we don't uh, crush our hospitals, that we don't have a surge in our hospitals that uh, overreach their capacity and we overwhelm them. And that is absolutely a, 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 a major piece of why we've we wanted people to continue to social distance and why we've said stay home as much as you can. But the other piece of it is uh, we don't want community spread. Uh, and and it's if you have community spread, that's when you're going to get the crush on the hospitals. And that's when we're going to overwhelm our hospitals if we have that community spread. And again, um, that's why I think it's so important that we, we do this in a very measured Way uh, um, out uh, phased approach uh, to restarting our economy in St. Pete and Pinellas County and Hillsborough County and Tampa and throughout the state. I think that's the best way uh, that we prevent us having to have mass quarantines uh, happening again. Uh, and so, certainly, that's what we want to see happen here in St. Pete. And I, and I know in my conversations uh, with the county administrator, he feels the same way. We, we, we want to be really smart in how we do this uh, because we think it'll pay dividends in the long run for us. Sheila, let's get to your question in just a second. But first, I want to go to one that was emailed to me so we make sure that the folks who contacted me directly also have their chance. John Doyle uh, is asking, will the mayor release a list of businesses that receive funds? He says, I've talked to many who applied early but never received any money. Yeah, so uh, if, if, if you've applied and you haven't gotten a response back telling you that you've been denied or approved, that means that your application is still in process. Um, we, as you might expect, we have gotten a lot of applications that have come in. Uh, our staff is going through them as quickly as is possible because we know how important it is to get those funds out. Uh, and um, so I would say that to, to, if you haven't received word yes or no, um, then hang tight, it's coming. And you will find out whether you've, you've been accepted or denied. Also, <clears throat> if you have been previously denied, take a look at phase two, uh, because if, for example, you were a business owner in St. Petersburg, but you didn't, and you had a, a restaurant, and you didn't live in St. Petersburg, but your restaurant was here, phase two, you will now be, um, eligible to apply. And so we would ask you to go ahead and reapply uh, starting tomorrow. All right. Sheila is asking about vacation rentals. Uh, what about hotels and vacation rentals? Do we know if short-term vacation rental ban is going to be extended? Yeah, again, I, I, I don't know that that wasn't something that the governor specifically addressed, at least in his comments. Uh, and that's why I think it's so important uh, for us, uh, for all of us really, uh, to take a look at that order and and really see exactly what is spelled out in that order because you know oftentimes in press conferences you know they hit that they hit uh, certain uh, industries that they know everybody is is certainly interested in that doesn't mean the others aren't people aren't interested in them but uh, it may not have been top of mind and uh, it may be addressed in the order 
so we're going to look to see what what his order says, and certainly it's it's one of the things that we are discussing internally, uh, and we are looking for uh, recommendations also from our uh, advisory group as to uh, the hospitality industry as a whole. We, we're seeing a question here about condos and having their pools open. Now that's set to happen uh, tomorrow. Monday. Monday. Uh, Monday, Monday, I believe it is. Yeah. Monday, it, the beaches are open. Um, the beaches and pools open on Monday. Okay. In Pinellas County, um, social distancing is required uh, in the, at the beaches and the pools. 50% uh, capacity is, uh, I believe, what the county's order is. Um, let's go to another question that was emailed to me. Uh, Jim Fogel is asking, with thousands of new condo apartments in St. Pete, uh, all using our water, trash, and sewer system, why have not they? Uh, why haven't they received lower rates and new sewage plants? I'm sure that's a favorite one for you, Mayor. You've been dealing with that for a while here. Uh, I, I, I guess he's saying uh, is the, because. I, I'm trying to make sense of this question. Actually. Yeah, I, I am too. <laughs> uh, the, so let me let me just say this about um, about our our, our our wastewater and stormwater system. Um, we have uh, obviously there's 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 been uh, talk in the past and, and rightfully so about issues that we had in 2015 uh, and 2016. We have invested significantly uh, in upgrading our uh, wastewater system. Um, increasing capacity in our treatment plants, um, repairing our, our uh, lines, our manhole covers. Um, we have been, uh, for the first time ever, uh, we've undertaken a wastewater master plan. And for the first time in over 22 years, um, we renewed our stormwater uh, master plan. Uh, and that plan is, is um, being finalized and getting ready to be rolled out. Um, and uh, that will be a long-term process as far as implementing all the aspects because it is a master plan. Um, but quite frankly, our, our wastewater and stormwater system, in particular our wastewater system, is really in better shape than it has been in, in, in decades. There's, uh, there's more capacity than we've ever had. We have more pipes that have been repaired uh, and manhole covers. And so we're in, we're in significantly better condition and shape than we were uh, in uh, even five years ago. All right, let me combine two questions here. We'll get to Daniel's question in just a second. But uh, Karen Jensen is asking, is St. Petersburg going to be testing anyone who wants to be tested for the virus and without cost? And I want to combine that with one of our online questions here on our Facebook Live uh, event uh, with Lynn's question, why aren't there any state testing sites in Pinellas County? Yeah, so they're, they're um, and in fact, this weekend at Bartlett Park, uh, from 8 to noon, uh, we will have uh, a testing site that is available uh, in partnership. County is, uh, we are working with the county on that. Uh, we are encouraging people to make an appointment uh, to ensure that uh, they'll, they're able to have that test. There still are testing sites at all of our hospitals. And in the Carillon area, we are working with, uh, and partner with uh, our local hospitals and, uh, and also working through the county health department uh, to get more testing available here in Pinellas County. Um, I, you know, I think uh, at least in the short term, I don't think we're going to be at a point where anyone who wants it has the uh, ab ability to have that test. Um, but where we need to be uh, is where anyone who is symptomatic uh, has the ability to get that test immediately and to get results from those tests within 24 to 48 hours. Uh, that is one thing that we are working on right now with the state. Uh, I've had conversations uh, with uh, the emergency manager for the state of Florida, with our area hospitals to put that program together. That is, as I mentioned, one of the indicators that I think is really important as we start to restart our economy to make sure that we're in that position so that anybody who is symptomatic can get tested and we can get those results. Uh, let's move to Daniel's question here. He's asking us uh, what financial issues would the city uh, deal with regarding loss of income to the city because of the economy being shut down? Any loss of services or reductions of service? Yeah, thank you for that question, Daniel. And, and uh, yeah, we are, we are as a city, uh, we are definitely sustaining losses of revenue. Uh, you know, when you think about um, uh, the, the, the tax revenue that we, we get from sales taxes and, and clearly you know, there's, there, that's going to be a significant hit. 
Um, there, there's a number of different categories where we receive revenue that are going to be impacted. Uh, and so we are, we are doing two things right now. Our budget and finance department are looking at our current fiscal year. Uh, and we were actually right in the middle of um, uh, working on um, our budget for the FY21 budget, um, meeting with council, uh, and there's going to be a community forum coming up um, related to that budget. And we know that uh, when, as we start getting better data about the fiscal impact of, of the shutdown that, that, and, and how it's impacted our revenues, we're going to have to make some significant adjustments. You know, what's unfortunate and, and has been really disappointing to us, uh, to our city, to the city of Tampa, to, a, to cities all throughout the, the state of Florida and around the country, is that third round of stimulus of the CARES Act, uh, while it provided for state and local governments to receive funding, they put a cap in there where only local governments with populations of 500,000 or higher were going to get those dollars. Well, in the state of Florida, the only city that received money uh, because they had a population of 500,000 or more was the city of Jacksonville. So that means cities like Orlando and St. Petersburg and Tampa and Miami and Fort Lauderdale, Hialeah, those are the seven largest cities in the state. Of that seven, only one city is getting those federal dollars that can be used to help offset uh, some of the losses that are a direct to, to our revenues that are a direct result of COVID-19. And so all of us are hoping that if there is a fourth round uh, of stimulus, that um, that round makes it down to us um, so that our services and the quality of life that we've been able to provide for the residents of St. Petersburg isn't negatively impacted due to our loss of revenues. You know, Mayor, they say all politics is local, but perhaps uh, all pandemics, uh, God forbid we have another one, should be local too, at least on how to handle it. Do you find that the fact that uh, the federal government sort of cascades things down to the states and the states then sort of cascade things down to local counties and cities and essentially defer to uh, the most local of leaders on how they should handle it, is that a good strategy? Has that worked for you? Do you find that that's really the best way to approach this? Uh, what do you make of the leadership at the state level and how they've handled this so far? Would you rather be the one making the call on the ground in your particular city as opposed to, say, a governor uh, or further up the food chain telling you how to do stuff? You know, normally I'm uh, always uh, shouting from the rooftops about local control uh, and home rule. Because uh, I do think, you know, we know our communities better than anyone. Certainly, uh, we know, and I know what's important in, this, in the city of St. Petersburg better than a state representative who wrote, uh, represents a rural community, maybe in North Florida, for example. Right. Uh, when it comes to something like this, um, you know, one of the, I've said pretty consistently that uh, I think it was important for there to be statewide policy um, and, and in, in, if you're going to have statewide policy, though, it's also really important that those who are making that statewide policy also seek out uh, and talk to those of us who are on the local level so they get a flavor for what we're experiencing in our community and they can take that into consideration as they're making their policy. Just like I'm doing here in St. Pete where I'm reaching out to the business community, to the arts community, to the various communities throughout the city of St. Petersburg so I have a better understanding of what they're experiencing and I can take that into consideration as I make decisions that are going to impact them. Uh, I think it's important that the state of Florida speak to us around the state, uh, those of us who are the decision makers, about what we're experiencing so that they can take that into consideration. And that's, I think, been one of the disappointments for me in how this has been handled is the communication uh, overall between Tallahassee and local governments I don't think has been as robust as it could have been. Uh, I think we've been left out uh, of some of uh, the decisions that have been made and certainly uh, we've, uh, seeking out our opinion has not happened. There's been some communications breakdowns where orders have been put out. Uh, the next day a subsequent order is put out, then frequently asked questions come out that seem to contradict and that's resulted in some, some confusion. So I think communication certainly could have been better uh, throughout this whole process and we certainly hope they are going forward. 
If you're just joining us, everyone, we are on our Facebook Live event tonight, special town hall meeting with none other than Mayor Rick Kreisman of St. Petersburg. I'm Paul Barone. Glad to have you with us. We invite you to ask all of your questions, so please continue to do so. We're seeing our columns fill up here with some really good questions. Bob Rothman has one, Mayor. Any decision on summer camp yet? Uh, I can tell you, a lot of parents, including myself, yeah. Two boys who are like little puppies in the house right now, bouncing off the walls. That's a question on the top of a lot of people's mind. Uh, absolutely, I, and I certainly understand that. Whether it's summer camps or or childcare, uh, that's that's a significant issue. And you know, in in our um, uh, leisure services department, which is uh, oversees our parks and recs and 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 our summer camp programs, we are at least for for uh, to get ready. We are going through the process. Of, uh, of at least getting ready for summer camps in the event that we feel it is safe for us to um, to roll out summer camps. You know, the big issue again is, can we do it safely where um, it's safe for our children and it's safe for our employees who are working in those camps? And that's one of the issues that that we're certainly gonna be looking at uh, because that's, that's of the utmost important. We wanna make sure uh, that our kids are safe, you know, that, and as parents that we feel comfortable uh, sending our kids off to those camps and that they're going to be safe and they're not going to bring something home uh, that could uh, contaminate us or cause us to get the virus. And we want to make sure our, our employees who are working those summer camps. Uh, and to that point, I don't recall, and correct me if I'm wrong, that doesn't seem to be explicitly laid out in phase one of the governor's plan when it talks about uh, summer camps, uh, as far as I know. Yeah, I'm, I'm not sure it is, and, and, it, and I'm going to be really anxious to, uh, to look at that. I know there are some entities who have, uh, in, 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 the, uh, in the region, who have uh, done some and been able to have some child care services that are available. Uh, I know my staff is speaking with them uh, because we want to see how they're doing it and um, what, what they've put in place to try and make sure that they've kept everybody safe. I think that's, that's what's really important is we look at what best practices not just in our community, but around the country uh, have been. Uh, you know, one of the things that I've tried to do and is every week um, I try and get on a, 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 uh, a Zoom meeting uh, that, uh, that, Way of the world. <laughs> yeah, that Bloomberg Harvard City Leadership Initiative puts out. Um, we have uh, experts from Johns Hopkins Medical that are on there. We have a number of different experts, in, including uh, we've had three former presidents who have gotten on and, and spoken to us. Um, along with the U.S. Conference of Mayors, where it gives me an opportunity to hear what communities and my colleagues all around the country are doing, what's worked for them, what hasn't worked for them, uh, to see if any of those ideas would work here in our community. Yeah, the sharing of ideas uh, at a faster speed these days with Zoom. Yeah. Uh, Aaron Reed asking us, what about bars? I have several friends that own small bars uh, that are suffering terribly, and I can only imagine uh, what that is like, uh, small businesses. And that is one that, uh, you know, if they are going to open up on state level, if they're a restaurant bar, we're talking 25% capacity as we look at a Florida Phase 1, which was released today by Governor Ron DeSantis. Shortly became, before we came on with this uh, town hall event, the governor uh, talking about uh, outlining what Phase 1 looks like. Restaurants may offer outdoor seating with six foot space between tables and indoor seating at 25 percent capacity but uh mayor as as you mentioned you're still weighing the pros and cons of all this uh because the caveat to all of this uh, is that counties can make their own call cities can make their own call when it comes to uh this phase one yeah it, it's um it did say and and uh, and i think he may have made it in his comments he may have said that there's no change to policy for bars and gyms and some other things. And so, you know, what, what does that exactly mean when he says there's no change in policies? Does that mean that at this point in time, at least for this phase, uh, he is saying that bars cannot reopen? Uh, do we as a city or county have the latitude uh, if we feel that there's a way of, of uh, reopening bars that that can happen? So we really need to take a look at that. Uh, and then uh, if we have that latitude, decide whether um, there's any restrictions that we want to place, whether it's 25% capacity, 50% capacity, they can only open if they're able to create uh, that six foot social distancing buffer. You know, those are some of the things that we want to take a look at um, in, in, in when it comes to bars. But again, 
Bars are one of the categories uh, for our Fighting Chance Fund. If you're business and you had a bar here in St. Petersburg um, and you live in St. Petersburg or it's beginning tomorrow, even if you don't live in St. Petersburg, you got 25 employees or less and you're a bar in St. Petersburg, you're eligible to employ uh, uh, apply for our Fighting Chance Fund relief. What about bars that serve food? Would they be classified as a restaurant and hence being able to open at 25% capacity, uh, assuming that uh, you guys go along with this in some, some way? I think that when it comes to uh, the bars that serve food, one of the triggers that, that has been looked at is what's the percentage of food sales versus uh, liquor sales. Um, and I think that may be based on, uh, uh, or uh, or liquor license, is your, is your license to operate a, a bar? Is that how you're licensed with the state or are you licensed as a restaurant with a bar? So I think from, from a county standpoint, that may be one of the factors that the county and its order put in place and, and we're operating right now under the under the county's order in St. Petersburg at least. Let, if I may make some sort of assumption that at some point uh, St. Petersburg and Pinellas opens, whether it's on the exact timeline of, of, of May 4th or not, is this not going to be hard to enforce uh, these sort of very specific guidelines of 25% capacity? Is that something that is going to be easy to make sure that uh, that, that businesses are, are, are adhering to? Yeah, I, I, I do think, um, you know, 25% is going to be a bit challenging for law enforcement uh, because, you know, if you don't know what the capacity is of that, of that building, of that space, you know, it's hard to judge, well, this is 25%, uh, this is a third, um, you know, but I will say this, in, in St. Pete, uh, one of the things I talked about on Monday when I, uh, was meeting with my advisory group is uh, we we have something we call that we're calling the St. Pete Way, uh, and what that means is is that here in St. Pete, I think what what we're hoping is is that uh, our community and and this is what we've seen thus far by the vast majority of the people living in St. Pete, they recognize the importance of us following basic CDC guidelines, following social distancing rules, staying at home wearing masks when we can as, as, as frequently as we can, doing the things that we need to do to keep our community as a whole safe, to, to keep our numbers down so we don't have community spread, so we don't overwhelm our hospitals. And, you know, my hope is, is no matter what uh, the governor's rules are or what rules come down from the county or the city, that, that our community continues to operate that way and, and do what we think is, this is St. Pete way, what's best for us as a community um, to make sure that we recover from this as quickly as possible and get back to a no, more of a normalcy that we're used to. Well, there really is a social contract mechanism that kicks in, doesn't it? And you've seen it uh, in St. Petersburg. Certainly I've seen it on this side of the Bay in Tampa where people are looking out for each other. They are. In, in ways that they probably never thought they would, but there's something I think in, in instinctive that kicks in uh, when we know that we're down. That we and we've seen it during hurricanes too. I think the Florida as a state is sort of is sort of veteran uh, a veteran when it comes to dealing with some kind of disaster or at least preparing for disaster. Every year we go through the song and dance of of storms coming uh, or threatening to come through Florida. And we've been through this exercise before. And so maybe that's hardened us to a, an extent uh, of knowing how to look out for each other, how to respond, how to come together as a community. Uh, and so um, I, I'm sure that that will be uh, a thing that we'll continue to see. Karen is asking you something here. Uh, Karen Reed, thank you so much, Mayor. She says, I'm sure that you've been under tremendous stress and I thank you. God bless you. Uh, thank you, Karen. We can get personal for a second. <laughs> uh, you know, we were talking about this earlier. Um, I can only imagine what it's like to be uh, a decision maker in a city, in a county, or a state. I mean, you saw you saw the governor. Let's put politics aside for a second. Yeah. Uh, for those of you who are, are asking your questions that may have one political persuasion or another, the governor tonight. Uh, got emotional uh, at the top of his announcement when he mentioned his his newborn granddaughter, or newborn daughter, and the fact that his uh, his his parents, her grandparents, could not hold her yet. Uh, yeah. He mentioned uh, how that was obviously bizarre, and it and it kind of got to him. And I think a lot of us have probably been holding those emotions in check and yeah. back. But there are points in your life where you where you think about maybe someone you love that you haven't been able to see in a while, how things have been anything but normal. And I can only imagine that it, that it does 
you must have private moments where where you just how do you get through this? How do you get how do how do you personally deal with that? Yeah, it it is hard, and you know I I, I still remember um, not long ago uh, where uh, just looking at Facebook and all of a sudden I see somebody posting about a friend of mine um, who passed away from from COVID nineteen and thinking oh my god you know he was posting a couple of days ago and all of a sudden he's gone you know and it really brings it home how quickly you know the world as we know it can change and someone that you were talking to a couple of days later can be gone and taken from us you know and and this is real you know and as much as there's yes there are people who are asymptomatic that are walking around and may never know they had it there are also people who are dying uh, and family members and loved ones and mothers and fathers, brothers, sisters, um, you know, and so, yeah, that weighs heavily on, on me. And yes, I worry about the economics uh, because, you know, it's our small businesses here in particular in St. Pete that really make St. Pete what it is and give us our character. And, you know, I talk about that all the time. It's, that's why St. Pete is what St. Pete is. It's those businesses and the thought of those businesses going under and the people who I know personally who own them, uh, you know, struggling, it, it, that tears at my heart too. Uh, so, you know, for me, it's been about just trying to do what I think is the right thing for our community, trying to be honest about it uh, and transparent about the decisions I make. You know, I, I'm going to use the Fighting Chance Fund as, as just an example for the way I've had to think about this stuff. You know, I, I could have done it one of two ways that fund. We could have rolled it out and opened it up to the entire community and said, anyone, any business that, that's in St. Pete, you can apply for this. But I also knew that we had limited funds. And if I did that, there was going to be an awful lot of people who applied that would never see any of that money because we couldn't, we couldn't help everybody. And so instead, what we tried to do is narrow it down as far as who is eligible to a, to a pool that we knew we could take care of. So we didn't want to create unreasonable expectations and say, if you meet this criteria and you apply, we wanted to be able to say, if, if you meet the criteria, you apply, you're going to get money and help from us in the city of St. Petersburg. What I didn't want to do was say, if you meet the criteria and you apply, eh, we might not be able to help you and give you false expectations and false hope. I'd rather be honest up front uh, than give you false hopes because that doesn't do anybody any good. And that's tough. That's hard. Uh, but that's the way that I've, we've tried to do it. It's the way I've tried to approach things. Uh, I get the emails. I get the Facebook posts. I, I, I hear from people. And, and it kills me that I can't help them. Um, the only thing I can do to help them is get us through this as quickly as possible. And God help us that we don't have it a second surge that's significant where we have to shut down again. Well, and, you know, I, I also think about hurricane season, which is 33 oh. days away. And yeah everything that that, that that involves. And I mentioned it earlier, sort of a badge of honor, uh, the fact that we go through this every year so that, you know, we maybe compared to other states, kind of know what it's like to be in that cone of uncertainty when you can't really guarantee uh, what tomorrow is going to look like. I think we, uh, you know, that's perhaps uh, one of our strengths. However, at the same time, it prevents challenges in, in what hurricane season would look like during a, a pandemic. Uh, any, any news on that front from your end? Uh, and, and what are those discussions like right now? All right, we're, we're absolutely having those discussions. Um, and in particular, um, you know, we're, it really comes into play the most is when we talk about our shelters, you know, because typically if there's a hurricane coming and people have to evacuate, you know, we bring them all into a shelter. Well, we've got to rethink how we do that uh, because, you know, how do you bring people into a shelter? Uh, potentially if you're still having to social distance and do that and keep people safe. So yeah, we are having those discussions. My uh, director of emergency operations the county's director of emergency operations, the state's director, those are communications that are ongoing and conversations that are ongoing uh, so that we make sure that uh, when, you know, we get into the heart of season, we're ready. 
we are I'm just scrolling through some of the questions here. We, we get a lot of comments, more comments than questions, perhaps. So I'll invite all of our viewers uh, to ask uh, any question for uh, Mayor Rick Kreisman, who we're talking live to here on our Facebook live page. I want to go through maybe perhaps some uh, rapid fire questions here, see if we can get through as many of these as possible. Greg is asking, in downtown St. Pete, is there a time of closure for restaurants? Will it be 10, 10 p.m., 12 p.m., or allowed to stay open? Till 3 a.m. Till <laughs> Greg wants it to be 3 a.m. There, he wants to have a good time. Yeah, we, we haven't made that that final decision yet. I'm still hearing from uh, our restaurateurs uh, as to what they feel comfortable with. You know, one of the things that that's kind of interesting um, that, and, and I don't know that the governor's order addresses this, but you know, what I've heard from our restaurateurs is, hey, you know, we can't just flip the switch, even if the the, 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 the city, the county, the state were to say, you can start your business tomorrow. What I've heard from them is we're not ready. Right. We won't be ready to just flip the switch and start our business tomorrow. We've got to, we got to get our staff back. We've got to get our operations back. We need to know how we're operating. Uh, and so those are still decisions that, that we have to, to settle in on. Uh, I'm still getting recommendations and uh, getting opinions that are shared with me and, and ultimately we'll make that decision. I, I would be surprised if out of the gate, we said, oh, we're gonna stay open till 3 a.m., uh, 10 p.m. or midnight, that's more of a possibility, but I don't see 3 a.m., quite frankly, being what will stay open till to at least right out of the gate. All right, uh, just trying to get through uh, some of these as quickly as possible. Rebecca is asking, what about Derby Lanes opening up in the near future? Yeah, I, <laughs> uh, I, I'm not sure, uh, when Derby Lane's going to be able to open, it, they, they, you know, under the governor's order, uh, if 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 he is uh, if that's one of the businesses that that he is now going to allow to be opened, and uh, and he says to the cities and the counties that this is this is uh, a business that that you cannot uh, regulate any further, then then that'll be open. If his order doesn't address it, then it'll be something that uh, certainly the city and the county um, have to talk about. That is. Derby Lane is is uh, outside city limits, so even if I were to say, no, I don't think Derby Lane ought to be open, I, I don't have the authority to regulate Derby Lane, uh, so that will be a county decision. Uh, some of these we have covered here. What about tennis courts uh, and pickleball, dog parks, et cetera? That's coming from Tracy. Yeah, those are, uh, when it comes to uh, city facilities uh, like pickleball courts, tennis courts, dog parks, um, it, it, it is definitely going to be something we're going to be taking a look at uh, as part of uh, whether we want to start reopening those uh, as part of the first phase of our reopening. Right now, all of our parks remained open. That is, is something that we did that uh, across the Bay, for example, uh, they chose not to do. Um, we have, a, you know, th that was one area where we, we differed from them. Uh, we did end up uh, closing our tennis courts and our pickleball courts and dog parks uh, a week or two ago, just because we were we were having some issues there, um, but you know, if we reopen them, we're certainly going to ask our residents, "Hey, you know, we still need you to social distance. We still need you uh, to follow CDC guidelines and be safe, um, because we don't want to have to um, reclose them or or look at having an issue because we reopen." And you have pretty much been pretty consistent and on the same page with your counterpart, Mayor uh, Jane Castor, on the on the Tampa side of the bay. Uh, but Kimberly is asking, will you be coordinating a plan with Mayor Castor for some consistency for the Tampa Bay area? Are, are there are there areas where you guys uh, overlap or areas that differ? I know you just mentioned one, but are there more? Yeah, overall, I think um, uh, Mayor Castor and I have, and, and we talk quite frequently. Um, we've, we've tried and we think it was important for us as the two largest cities uh, in the Bay Area to be as consistent in our policies as is possible. Um, so for example, one of the things that we talked about was, do we think it makes sense to mandate uh, everyone uh, in our community wearing masks? And ultimately, you know, uh, we ended up saying, well, we're not ready to go there yet, but we certainly want to encourage the use of them. Um, and so we, we will, we'll, we're going to continue to have discussions and talk about, okay, here's what we're thinking about doing. What are you guys thinking about doing? And, uh, and, and hope that we can be as aligned as, as, as much aligned as possible. S equally, I think it's important for Pinellas and Hillsborough County to be as aligned as is possible. May not be perfectly aligned, 
but the more aligned we are, the easier it is for, for people um, to understand what's going on on either side of the bay. Of course, the real question is, would you have kicked Tom Brady out of a public park? <laughs> well, in St. Petersburg, he wouldn't have been kicked out because he was allowed <laughs> to be in our parks. But uh, yeah, I think we, we may have made TMZ with that one. Right. <laughs> uh, speaking of sports, by the way, uh, any news on uh, the baseball front of things? I, I, I know that uh, Major League Baseball came out today and said that they're they're batting around this plan, no pun intended, uh, of, of dividing up the league into three divisions and and playing at select stadiums. Would Tropicana Field be one of those stadiums? Have you heard anything with that? Well, that is one of the rumors that I've heard is that they are uh, considering uh, possibly Tropicana Field. Uh, I don't know. Um, I will say this about our, our uh, I want to say this about our sports teams in general. Uh, the Rays, the Bucks, the Lightning, uh, those three organizations have really stepped up in this community and in, in the Tampa Bay area. Uh, they've provided resources uh, to us here in St. Pete for our Fighting Chance Fund. Uh, they've provided resources for a number of different uh, nonprofits like Feeding Tampa Bay. Uh, I know Tom Brady did the same thing. Mm -hmm. And so I, I, I really can't say enough good things uh, about uh, Stu Sternberg and the Rays, about uh, Jeff Finnick and the Lightning, about Brian Glazer and the Glazer family and the Bucks. Um, you know, that's, that's really what you want to see. And, there, and there's a number of other organizations and businesses throughout our community uh, that are really stepping up and uh, trying to help uh, our, our, those who are really suffering here. And, and to me, that's what's so great about living in St. Petersburg and living in the Tampa Bay area. We care about each other. We care about those who are struggling and we try and help each other. Yeah. Something to be proud of. Uh, and I know we're a long way off perhaps from 50,000 people or so gathering to watch a sporting event. Uh, even though I know that people are, are ready, at least in their hearts to, to want to see that again. And that'll be a, a glorious day when it happens. Yes, uh, if baseball were to do something like that. Uh, do you foresee, I guess, that being a situation where fans would not be able to be there in person? It would be, uh, I think that's some one of the things they're talking about. It would be yeah. a team. I mean, I think it really depends on uh, the timing when they're talking about this happening. And it really depends on what we're seeing from uh, related to the data, you know, um, and, and what we're hearing from our, our uh, medical community and our health experts you know, we, we are trying to rely really heavily on the data that we're receiving uh, and from our, our uh, healthcare experts and our medical experts so that when we're making decisions, we're making decisions that uh, make sense, that keep our community safe, that prevent community spread and prevent our hospitals from being overwhelmed. And I think if we get to a point where we can do that uh, and have fans in the stands, whether it's you know, uh, open seating or it's limited seating where there's social distancing, you know, that remains to be seen. And, and I think it'll really determine, be determined by, by when and what the data looks like. Uh, Greg is asking, uh, how will we in St. Pete take care of our employees if restaurants are 25% capacity? Uh, we won't be able to offer enough hours or they won't be making enough tips to equate to more than their unemployment benefits. Uh, that's a tough situation. I mean, yeah. this 25% guideline. Uh, I know it comes from a good place in terms of public safety, but it does present uh, small business owners uh, with a new set of problems. Well, and, and, and that was one of the things that, that, that I heard that was expressed to me by some of the restaurateurs who I'd, who I'd spoken with. Uh, they had some concerns about what the governor's order was going to say. They'd heard some rumblings that that 25% might be uh, the threshold that was set. Uh, and uh, uh, what was expressed to me was concerned that they might not be able to open because it might not make financial sense to open. Uh, mm -hmm. So, you know, what we were going to look at um, from was what, where is that threshold where it makes sense, where you can safely open, you know, is it at 50%? Is it where you say, all right, well, we're not going to look at the percentage of capacity. Instead, we're going to look at, um, can you separate your tables and provide that six foot of social distancing between the tables so that everyone who takes comes into your restaurant or sitting in the street at the cafe is doing so where they're social distancing safely? And how would that be for the business community? Would that allow them to survive? 
Does it make sense? So those are all some of the questions that we've been asking and that we're trying to get some recommendations from uh, from our business community. Uh, if you're just joining us, we got about five minutes or so left here on our town hall event on our Facebook live page. And we're speaking with Mayor Rick Kreisman from St. Petersburg. He's been kind enough to answer a whole host of questions here. Uh, in the time that we have left, we'll get through some of these as quickly as we can to make sure that we're answering your questions. And of course, it's not too late to send in your questions, so please continue to do that. But Mayor Kreisman, uh, I want to ask this question from Mary Bell. Uh, she wants to know, any consideration for extended grants for child care like YMCA uh, as we reopen our city? Yeah, um, I mean, certainly child care uh, and being able to uh, provide child care is, is something that, that you know, we, we really have to take a hard look at and see if there's a way we can figure out where it can be done safely. Uh, because I think it's tough when you say, all right, businesses, you can reopen, but how many of those business owners have young children at home? And if they, ha if they don't have child care, then will they be able to reopen? And if so, what do they do with their children? So that's one of the things that we're trying to look at and, and get a handle on is that, is there a way to do that uh, and do it safely? Um, and, and, and so that it, it doesn't have a negative impact on businesses, but also uh, it doesn't put our kids at risk. Leslie Anthony asking us, is pet grooming classified under personal services or are grooming salons able to reopen provided they are able to adhere to CDC social distancing guidelines? Yeah, I think that's um, that is uh, right now under the county's uh, order, uh, and, and that, again, that's subject to, subject to change. We're going to look and see what the governor's order says. Uh, we're going to be talking with the county, and um, and then uh, I expect there to be a revised county ordinance that'll be coming. Um, as I, as I've, as I mentioned before, we we continue to have discussions with the county so that we make sure that the the uh, feelings of St. Pete. Are, are heard and are part of the county order because uh, we're going to be following that order. I uh, also want to mention uh, the peer decision because yeah. uh, obviously people have been waiting for the peer <laughs> uh, and the progress on that. Where does that stand right now? Yeah, we've, we've uh, temporarily postponed the opening, the grand opening of the peer, which was scheduled for May 30th. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's, it's uh, based on what the governor had previously said even before today. You know, that he didn't really want any mass gatherings in the month of May to take place at all. Um, and clearly, uh, we expect there to be a huge turnout for when the, we were able to open the doors. I think, and, and I was just out there uh, looking at it over this past weekend, uh, I think the public is going to be blown away uh, by what they see uh, when they finally see this. Because, you know, and, and if you see that looking at, your, at the screen right now, that, that's the pier head itself. Uh, but there's 26 acres uh, of an entire district that the public is going to get the, the, the ability to really enjoy. And that's something different than we've ever had in our history of, the, of having a pier. Uh, it is really quite a park that has been created out there with great amenities from the restaurants to Tampa Bay Watch, which you just had uh, on the screen a moment ago. And so I'm, I'm super excited. I wish we were opening on May 30th. Uh, but uh, we will be announcing uh, in the near future, some at some point when we're when we feel like uh, we can safely open and have a, a grand opening celebration of the pier. When that will be, uh, so just keep your eyes and ears peeled for when that date is forthcoming. We will look forward to that. I can tell you, growing up here in Tampa Bay, I remember the old pier, the inverted pyramid, and that was an icon of Tampa Bay, much like the Sunshine Skyway Bridge. And so it's something to definitely celebrate. It's a big accomplishment for our area. Uh, just looking through some of these questions uh, as we're uh, almost out of time here for our Facebook Live event, I uh, want to make sure we get to everyone that we can. Uh, this really hits to the heart of it. Uh, Jose is asking us, dear mayor, is it safe? This is kind of a bottom line question. Is it safe to open retail and restaurants with limited testing in our area? Yeah, and that is, is, is for me, that's, that's one of the big indicators, uh, one of the big trigger points that I think, you know, as I mentioned um, on Monday to my uh, advisory group that, that I think is really important. We have got to make sure that if we are uh, reopening and restarting our economy and our opening our businesses, e even in a, a limited fashion, that we've got the testing 
readily available that we can test anyone who is symptomatic and get those tests back uh, in a in a, uh, a, a quick fashion and not a week or two weeks, but you know within 24 or 48, 72 hours, we've we've got to be in a position to be able to do that. Otherwise, we're not going to be able to contact trace. We're not going to be able to prevent community spread, uh, and we're not going to be able to prevent uh, a a rush on our hospitals. Uh, what about asymptomatic? I'm, I'm sorry. What about testing everyone, symptoms or no symptoms? Yeah, I, I, I'm not sure that's uh, where we need to be yet. I, I think it's more important that um, that we we have the ability to test anyone who's symptomatic and to be able to to have good contact tracing in place. Uh, you know, I, I think that's the most important piece right now. Uh, ideally, you'd be able to test everyone, but you know, I don't think if we if we were to say that's our criteria. Uh, I think it's going to be it'd be a long time before in a, we're in a position where we'd be able to reopen business at all, uh, because I just don't think that's that's something that we're going to you know we have 270,000 residents in St. Petersburg uh, to expect that we're going to be able to have 270,000 tests, be able to get everybody tested and turn it around quickly. I I I think we'd be setting ourselves up for failure. Um, I want to leave with a couple of things here. And by the way, thank you for everyone who has, who has been sending in your questions are really good questions. Um, not, not to pin you down or anything, Mayor, but uh, I know that this news dropped tonight with the governor uh, laying out phase one uh, of the plan to reopen the state of Florida, with a big caveat being that this is still up to local governments to decide how they're going to roll it out. Uh, May 4th, though, as the governor laid out tonight, Phase one would take place, and it includes uh, restaurants being able to open up at 25% capacity and a whole host of other details that we've mentioned already. You're still taking that into consideration. Uh, is there, can you commit here to any kind of timetable on, on when you might come to a decision? The reason I ask that is we have been getting questions, uh, presumably perhaps from business owners who are saying we need to be prepared uh, to make yeah. our own decisions. Uh, would you be able to, have a decision before May 4th, uh, yes or no, on whether or not the city or the county will reopen. Yeah, I, I certainly expect that we're going to be in a position uh, before May 4th to, to be able to let our business community know what's going on. I, it's, it's, you know, maybe this is because I'm, I'm a former state legislator and a, and a lawyer, but I need to see the document. I need to see the order yeah. and read it uh, and, and, and to make sure I fully understand uh, the, the, the full breadth of it and its impact on us here in St. Petersburg and in Pinellas County, whether we are in any way preempted. And if so, what does that look like? What can we do? What can't we do? And, and along with that, you know, I wouldn't want to make commitments today, not having heard from my city council tomorrow, uh, not having heard from all of my advisory group uh, members and to, and to hear from them and, and others in the community who've been reaching out to me and providing me with information. You know, I, I, I really tried to pride myself and I think it's really important uh, to get as, to get different points of view and to get as much information, opinions, recommendations, and data to help inform ultimately what is my decision. Because as, as you and I have both been saying throughout this, this interview today, these are tough decisions. And I know that the decisions I make uh, are, are going to impact people and their businesses and their livelihoods and their ability to make their mortgage payments or their rent payments. And so I don't take that lightly. I take that very seriously. Uh, and I want to make sure I have as much data and as much information as possible when I make that decision. Uh, but I also know that I want to make sure that I give people that the time that they need to, to gear up. You know, interestingly, several business owners, uh, restaurateurs said, Mayor, don't open before Cinco de Mayo. <laughs> That's a mistake. We saw it on St. Patrick's Day. So if you're going to open, don't open on a, a Friday, Saturday, or Sunday, and don't open before Cinco de Mayo. And then the governor announces he wants to open on the 4th, the, the day before Cinco de Mayo. Before Cinco de Mayo. Well, uh, the timing is everything, isn't it? I, I want to leave you with the last word because I know the Fighting Chance Fund is very important, and it's yeah. something that uh, a resource people can use right now. So if you can... Uh, the Fighting Chance Fund, what is it? Where can people sign up uh, and how do they do it? Yeah, you go to the city's website, stpete.org backslash Fighting Chance Fund. Um, you will see uh, a list of the requirements uh, that, that to, for eligibility for both individuals and businesses. 
Um, the second phase of it starts tomorrow where we've expanded the list of eligibility. Um, but the, the application, we, we streamline the application. It's a really simple online process that to, to apply for it. Uh, once you fill out that application, um, we're going to try and get through them as quickly as possible, but understand, you know, we've got a lot of folks who are, who are seeking that out. Uh, and so, uh, please be patient with us. We know you need the money, but we're going to get through them as quick as possible. The county is putting their plan uh, and their program out. So I want to encourage you also to check out um, the Pinellas County's website. Uh, if, if, I think it's PinellasCounty.org. Uh, and I'm sure they'll have a link for their program. The city of Tampa also has a program out. If your business is in Tampa uh, or you live in Tampa, um, go there because all of our communities, we're all trying to help and do everything we can because we know that people have had a difficult time getting through uh, for unemployment. They've had a difficult time getting federal dollars through PPP uh, or some of the other resources. Um, and so we're trying to do what we can to help you. On the city's website, we also have links to the federal dollars that are available and that have been made available through what some people have called uh, stimulus 3.5. Uh, and so check that out and, um, and there may be some opportunities still for you to get some of those dollars too. Yeah, people could use any help that they can right now Absolutely. if they struggle. Um, Mayor Kreisman, thank you so much for taking the time. Uh, we, we went through a lot of questions and of course uh, we will update you on the mayor's decision uh, as he evaluates uh, the governor's plan to reopen. Mayor Kreisman, thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Uh, I want to end where we began. Just a quick recap on the breaking news that came down today. Governor DeSantis uh, outlining what phase one will look like, announcing uh, that the state will reopen, at least in a limited capacity. There it is, Florida phase one. This goes into effect May 4th, which is Monday. Schools remain distance learning. Visits to senior living facilities are still prohibited. Elective surgeries, though, can resume at hospitals. Restaurants... And this is one of the big ones here, can offer outdoor seating with six foot space between tables, indoor seating at 25% capacity. Retail can operate, but at 25% of indoor capacity. Uh, and no change for bars, uh, in the purest sense of bars, gyms, and other personal services, and that includes hair salons. Uh, that is a, a quick, sort of off the top, version of what phase one there's more uh, details here uh, vulnerable individuals should avoid close contact with people outside the home all individuals in public maximize physical distance avoid socializing in groups of more than 10 people uh, in, in cases that it doesn't really uh, call for it uh, face masks are recommended for all those in face-to-face -face interactions and where you can't social distance uh, so that is what Florida phase one looks like as, we, as we've been talking to Mayor Rick Kreisman tonight uh, we'll leave it there. I, I guess I'll say, you know, this is this is personal for me too, Mayor. This is my hometown, Tampa Bay in, in the region. Grew up here, family on both sides, generations back. And, and I echo what you say. Uh, as a city, as a region, as a community, you have seen how people who live here are very practical in nature, uh, whether it's dealing with a hurricane or dealing with a pandemic. Uh, they not only come together, uh, but they have patience. And it's something that... Um, I've lived in different parts of Florida and in different parts of the country. Uh, you don't always see that. And in, in other words, we're, we're a great country, uh, but we're also a great state and we're, we're also a great community here in Tampa Bay. And uh, you've seen the best of all sides. So steady as she goes, patience wins the day and safety wins the day. And so I wish all of you a, a safe night. Uh, and the best uh, to you and your family. And uh, this is why we do the news. The story will change day to day. So keep with ABC Action News, uh, whether it's online or on the air. Join us tonight at 11. And of course, we will keep you up to date on everything. We're working on stories right now as we speak. So Mayor Kreisman, once again, thank you.